Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're going to get started. So as I'm sure many of you know, the Evo Institute is a vast library and archive which holds many documents, books, letters, posters, and pieces of music, and many other things which document Jewish life around the world. And one of the amazing stories that, uh, that our archive can tell is the story of music in America and how Jews from Eastern Europe have influenced that music. We have vast collections of theater music, of folk music, of classical music, we have sheet music, we have recordings, we have posters, we have concert programs, we have letters, we have the, the, um, the materials of institutions, and um, that all comes together to help us understand these incredible stories. And so tonight, we're um, partnering with Carnegie Hall, and we're, um, we're having a program which kind of tells the story behind a musical program that they're having next week, which is called From Shtetl to Stage. Um, this program is part of their Migrations Festival, which is celebrating the contribution of immigrants to American musical culture and to American culture at large. And this particular concert is focusing on East European Jewish contributions to American musical culture. So tonight we're going to get, we're going to really delve into this um, from a historical perspective. And we're really excited to have leading the charge, Mark Slobin, who there couldn't be a more fitting uh, scholar to be joining to be joining us tonight to be telling this story. Mark has has released seminal scholarship on the Yiddish theater, much of it which was researched here in this building using Evo, or perhaps not in this building before it was before Evo was in this building, but using the materials that are in this building um, on Yiddish theater and later really important work as well on, Yidd on Yiddish folk music. Um, so we're really delighted to have Mark here and uh, I'm going to just invite him up and let him take over from here. Mark Slobin. Thanks, Alex. It's, it's always great to be here. Um, I was just at a concert last night of Alex's music. I mean, every night there's something at Evo, and a lot of them are increasingly about music, which makes me very happy. Um, I'm going to do um, a talk with a kind of historically based talk, then I'm going to introduce the rest of the um, panel here and the speakers. Um, how many of you are going to the concert? Great. So I, um, the examples I'm going to play are examples that will be at the concert, pretty much. Um, so I'll, I'll do a little lead into that. I'm going to start first with my uh, patented 20-minute entire history of all Jewish American music. Um, and you'll come away with this for a sense of a structure and a framework uh, that you can use, you know, future in thinking about Jewish music in America. Um, I should say that the uh, title of the, of the concert is completely wrong. It is not from shtetl to stage. It's from wedding hall to wedding hall. Uh, from theater to theater, from cabaret to cabaret, because the people that came to this country were, the musicians particularly, were sophisticated musicians. They were not fiddlers who were hanging out on rooftops. Um, and so the story is one of um, real sophistication and cosmopolitanism, basically. So nevertheless, they can never avoid this from to, and it has to have a shtetl in it, okay. Um, so um, here's, here's the talk. Um, over the past, 140 years since the great wave of Eastern European Jewish migration to the United States and Canada began, the community has gone through huge changes. Across these decades of great social turbulence and massive historic shifts, the community's approach to music remains steady. Um, I'm going to lay out some main factors, some guidelines uh, of Jewish American music. Um, first, I'm going to start with two basic factors, and then I'm going to go through a whole bunch of things that you can um, kind of remember to listen for. Um, the two main factors overall are eclecticism and audience appeal. Why do I start with eclecticism? There's no such thing as Jewish music in the sense of ancient lineages of sound. Uh, even though in the synagogue they talk about songs, Mi Sinai, I don't think they were sung at Sinai. Um, Everywhere in the world across time, uh, Jewish music constantly negotiates between sources and ideas of what is Jewish and what is not Jewish, uh, with shifting and competing visions of the past and present. 
these dialogues and, and are really complex, and they reveal multiple identities and resonances, nowhere more so than in the volatile United States, a country marked by rapid change of taste and technology, and a country absolutely eager to be open to innovation. So this was the ideal place to open up and to be eclectic was to be successful. Okay. To be Jewish is something that might be helpful in that regard. Uh, um, so I'm going to talk about those things. As to audience appeal, musicians and listeners need to place their work in forms um, that can be recognized and consumed. These forms must be portable and durable. In the United States, as opposed to European societies, marketing is the main expression and indicator of appeal. This ranges from the commodification of popular music uh, or the more metaphorical selling of an aesthetic uh, to congregations uh, or social movements by musical leaders, such as cantors, choir directors, and uh, song leaders, and so on, who depend uh, on local taste. And so they're going to be extremely eclectic, as any of you know who've you know, gone through synagogues over decades or whatever you've done as Jewish Americans. Now, I'm going to, how does this get done? And this is where I turn to the nitty gritty. Um, this gets done in creating real songs, dances, concert pieces, and careers. Um, musicians work through three key c components, resources, strategies, and agendas. So I'm, that's what I'm going to do is detail those, and then we'll look at some examples and lay out those, uh, those issues. Resources. In the United States, there are two kinds of resources available to Jewish musicians. Those that are understood as being somehow Jewish, and those that are clearly connected to um, American uh, popular culture. First look at what are uh, Jewish music resources. Um, I mean, when I talk about resources, I'm talking about musical materials, the way a sound works, but it's also where do you play things, the performance venues. Um, what is the industry connected to this? Um, the Jews had their own in-house music industry, and what is the patronage? Who is supporting this music? Okay, these are the issues um, where the resources are what you draw from. What are uh, Jewish resources? Um, there are musical resources and social resources. Social resources are roles, and some of these are only Jewish. The cantor is only a Jewish role, and, the, and I did the history of the American cantorate, which has been here since 1696, the whole idea of what a cantor is completely changes over time. Everything goes on, but the fixed part is that this is a role, a social, an American profession. It's not like any other profession in America or any other musical profession. This is a Jewish musical resource, the idea of cantor, and originally the idea of klezmer, which morphs into the idea of being a band musician or something else, but starts as a very specific, actually, hereditary role. So these are roles um, that are Jewish and social resources, as well as ideas and ideologies about what is music uh, about. Um, then there are venues. The catering hall was maybe the main venue. Uh, the concert hall, the synagogue, uh, theaters, uh, summer camps, and many other things, which are specifically Jewish um, social resources. Okay, they're available to musicians. And then I mentioned this in-house industry, which you're going to see uh, pictures of from the forward uh, shortly. We have a wonderful presentation by Hannah Pollock from the forward that's going to show us um, stuff that really comes out of an in-house music industry. And I wrote a whole book about that called Tenement Songs, um, which uh, is about that kind of industry. Now, what are the musical resources? Um, this assumed Jewish element. There are, I talk about those in detail, um, the most uh, common assumed Jewish element. Um, how many of you can sing Hava Nagila? How many of you can sing the first four notes of Hava Nagila? Let's do it. Yanta. Da, da, da. Okay, that's all we need. That is the most identifiably Jewish component used in Hollywood film scores, used by composers, used by everybody. It's not really Jewish. They have it in Turkey. They have it, you know, in Greece. Um, but it's assumed. It's an understood Jewish component. It's an interval between the second and third of those. Da, da, those two between, that's called an augmented second by music theorists. Um, so this is a kind of musical resource. Um, then there are heritage resources, which is what you grew up with as Jewish. This is your heritage, you know, this is Jewish, or what's my music? Um, and we'll talk more about heritage resources. Um, okay. Uh, and then there are new resources that arrive with waves of history, such as 
Zionist songs. They didn't exist in the 1880s in such numbers as they do eventually and take over in so much way in our consciousness. We just sang one, right? Okay. Uh, or Holocaust songs, which didn't exist. That term Holocaust didn't even exist, and Holocaust songs. So there are uh, newer musical resources that arrive, but they may be based on the old ones, which we could go into if we had a three-hour seminar here. Okay. So what are American popular culture resources? Um, there are musical items that all Jews know as Americans. Um, this could include the Star Spangled Banner, but that's, you know. The, because when I was looking at the, uh, those archival sources at YIVO and looking at the parts and the directors, uh, the handwritten manuscripts of Yiddish theater, I looked at this one thing and I said, I don't understand what this guy wrote in, this conductor. It looked like Janky Dodol, and I said, what is this? And I realized it's Yankee Doodle in G, okay? So that is an American musical resource, which at the early 20th century, this guy said, right here, we will do Yankee Doodle. Um, that's what I mean by things which are understood by everybody, um, to, uh, but from a Jewish, you know, in a Jewish context as well. Um, there are, um, and of course, many things, not Yankee Doodle, but as you know, God bless America and so on, are written by Jews and Rhapsody in Blue and so on, other songs that everybody knows. But, and the question whether they're Jewish or not, I will not get into, that's an entire other issue and whole book's been written about that. Um, in addition, other resources are the styles of music, like swing, which becomes dominant in Jewish American music in the 1930s and 40s, you know, or the cha-cha-cha. There are styles, which then you use. Uh, there are contexts. I grew up singing in a car. I just published this book about Detroit, where I grew up, and I start with a kind of memoir section, and I have an anecdote about what we sang when we were riding in the car on summer vacation. This is a Jewish experience. It's a Jewish resource, okay? I mean, I should say, um, in the sense that we would sing some songs which were Jewish there. Um, and nowadays, of course, and then there's holidays, the songs for Pesach, and then there's social media now today, and all the YouTube videos. Um, then there are the commercial formats. It starts with sheet music, which we'll see. It goes through recordings, the first 78s, those, and no, first cylinders. Uh, Jewish music is recorded at the very dawn of recording. 20 years before any blues or banjos were recorded in America, there were cantorials and klezmer tunes being uh, produced because the industry started in New Jersey and the main audience they had was right here, where you're sitting. Okay? And so they did things for every ethnic group in New York and they did hundreds of, um, of records of Jewish content. So, and then the Jews had their own in-house industry in Yiddish, uh, which is something we'll be turning to. Okay, that's resources. Part two, strategies. Um, these are what creators use to use and adapt the resources to make them work for them and for their audiences. What are the strategies of Jewish American musicians? There are a whole lot of them, and I could reel off you know, probably a, a dozen good ones. I'll, I'll just talk to, a, I'll just mention like a few, and then I'll give you examples. One um, is domestication. That is to say, you take stuff that's outside, that's sort of wild and trafe or whatever, and you bring it into your house. That's what domestication is, an animal or a plant, right? And you do this with songs. So uh, in the 1890s, you can find a sheet um, music printing or a text for uh, a bicycle built for two days in Yiddish, in the 1890s. That's domestication, okay? Um, then there's, that leads to parody. So when you're doing that, you might change the words and introduce a Jewish content. We'll talk about that. There is, that also may involve edginess. Songs about discomfort, edgy, sarcastic, uh, difficult songs about life in America, about my wife, about whatever, uh, about politics, uh, about social issues. And that's very, very, profound. but there are songs that are kind of, are, can be very edgy. They're not just so, cozy and comfortable, as opposed to another uh, kind of um, resource uh, uh, strategy, which is nostalgia and heritage. Jews were not very nostalgic. They didn't like the old country very much until immigration stopped 100 years ago. Then they began to get nostalgic for what they left behind because it was sort of gone in a way uh, and, and other kinds of issues. But nostalgia, things that you know as nostalgic, my shtetl of belts, you know, these things, they're only from the, basically in the 1930s. Um, so you don't have early nostalgia. Heritage comes in in the 1970s, 80s, and beyond as a kind of standard uh, a strategy. Finally, agendas. 
and then I'll get to music. Uh, all of these things, the resources and the strategies, are in service of agendas, um, which are behind everything. There, some agendas are just like, this is my music, it's individual expression of musicians, I'm giving you my, you know, that's my agenda here is to do this right now, and, and work career development, which is an agenda too. Marketing is also an agenda. Then there's ideological agendas. What is the message here? You know, so um, this is where you really see how music maps onto the severe splintering of Jewish American life. When I did the book on, on Detroit, looking at the old you know, notices of concerts, I mean, every organization had its own concerts for their own agendas. The Trotskyites, the, the next, the lower and the higher Trotskyites, the higher and lower Stalinists, you know, through the Zionists, through the uh, uh, whatever agenda you want, the, you know. Um, so these are um, from socialist, unionist, Zionist, religious agendas, generational agendas, like this is our music, uh, and other such. Uh, gender has become an agenda, and post-gender is also now an agenda, okay? So uh, these, so it's resources, strategies, um, and agendas, okay? So now we'll look at um, just a few songs, because I only have a few minutes. Uh, so I'm going to use some that are on the concert. Um, the oldest one, I, well, practically the oldest one here is, um, um, is called What's Your Step? Um, and here's a little of What's Your Step. America is the land for you. Einer likes the business, einer soeft er graf. Einer op dat eet, en kip kost die spijt. Einer luipt er geen aklet op van ons bijt. Einer denkt me luipt van zijn naam, volk er geef. Einer luipt waar het is van zijn, wat je schijnt. Einer luipt in atleet, einer luipt in cabaret. Einer luipt in graf, zo waait er kop, kiet die meer. Wat je schijnt, heb je riemel vleet. Ah, okay. Um, okay, I think you can see from this text, which is nicely put up there, the domestication of, of English, the harnessing of English. Uh, and the harnessing of the environment here. I think you can see the edginess. It's very edgy. Uh, and um, this is a huge, but that's how I end up writing a book about this stuff. I just thought this was amazing. Nobody in 1970, 19, late 70s, when I was looking at this, nobody, I had no idea this repertoire existed. It was not available anywhere. Nobody told me this is really a wonderful part of Jewish American music, nothing. So um, this stuff is really, really uh, interesting. Um, so, um, and uh, the format. Uh, the resources here are, uh, what are what's, what's the style? Straight American. There's nothing Jewish about this. Okay. Absolutely nothing Jewish about that. Um, and the band, the band itself, the instruments, nothing Jewish about that. It's, a, it's like an orc a common band for a studio orchestra. and. Um, the voice, well, maybe it's a little Jewish. Uh, it's certainly annoying, you know. Uh, that much is clear. Uh, all right, let's move to uh, a little bit farther. Uh, and we always talk about Irving Berlin. Um, here's an Irving Berlin song you probably don't know. Okay. Oh, this, this track pad is pretty <laughs> Hear her croon, 
thing to stop, right? Um, okay, uh, this is being sung by Franklin Bauer, who's probably not Jewish, um, tenor with orchestra. Um, what is Jewish about this? Well, Irving Berlin's Jewish, okay. Um, but there is something Jewish about it. Um, this, is, um, this is a um, sentimental song, and it is nostalgic, I mean, despite what I just told you, but it's not marketed as nostalgia for Jews. It's marketed as exotic about the Russians for an American audience. Accidentally, it also works for Jews because my grandmother sang a Russian lullaby to me in Russian. She did. Did any of you know that? It's gone. Yes, yeah, some of you heard that song. Who are old enough? Okay. So the um, people in the audience knew a Russian lullaby would turn out to be Jewish. Okay. So this is what I mean by eclecticism. You draw from everywhere. This is a clever strategy on his part because he's appealing to two kinds of markets. The voice quality. Uh, notice how it changes from major into minor when it gets to Russia, okay? Because that's the, you know, the signifier. Those are the resources he's playing with, and his strategy is straightforward marketing. You know, there's nothing else about this that's going on here except he figured that was going to work. It didn't work that much. It's not one of his most famous songs, right? Okay. Um, okay, so. We'll move on uh, to another kind of uh, possibility. Oops. Uh, this is the great Moshe Oyser. How many of you have heard of Moshe Oyser? Wow, incredible. This is a still from his movie where he is, uh, has been an, uh, a Meshubid, he's been an apostate, and he's coming back to the synagogue, and after seeing Kul Nidre, he's going to die, okay? Because you don't leave the fold. You know, you come back. You know. So he, Marshall Oyster is a great character because he was uh, famous as a star of cabaret and movies uh, in the th 1930s, and he was famous as a cantor. He did it both, and he had a lot of trouble. Congregations would fire him because you know he was Marshall Oyster and he fooled around. Um, but um, so what is he singing here? He's going to sing Hot God Ya. Now, why would you make a commercial record of Hot God Ya? And um, he. Well, he went into different resources. This is a Jewish resource. Okay, no question, Chad Gad is a Jewish resource. But he's not going to sing a normal melody of Chad Gad He's going to do it as a Hasidic comedy number because that's the song that he's famous for. So even though he's starting with Chad Gad it's going to turn into this wonderful Hasidic ha ha, yabba baba thing because that's his shtick. Okay. Um, so um, he's playing on conservatism, nostalgia, post immigrant era. Uh, and he's playing out religious sentiment. Oh. <laughs> Sounds like Pesach, right? <laughs> okay. Uh-oh. <laughs> Okay, uh, so that's, um, yeah, I've got to move quickly. I mean, that's a, a really nice, weird number. But it's completely within this play, okay, of resources, strategies, and whatever his, the agenda is here. There are, there are numerous agendas uh, at work. Um, okay, we need to hit another couple of uh, topics really quick. Um, okay, we have, there will be a bunch of concert music on this program, um, and I, this can run because it's like eight seconds of intro. Um, this is a clarinetist. This piece by Abe Elstein, who wrote the music for Yiddel Mitten Fiddle, the movie, and for songs, but he also wrote concert music. And this is a Hasidic dance for clarinet played by the Los Angeles Philharmonic at the Walt Disney Concert Hall in 2006, commissioned by the Milken Collection of Jewish Music, which you should all go online for. The Milken Archive is free, and you can listen to a lifetime's worth of Jewish music free now from the Milken Archive, except they have very long leads in. Oh, it's not playing. Um, Okay. Um, so what we want to watch for is how is the clarinetist, what does the clarinetist look like when he comes out, and what does the music sound like? Mm -hmm. 
Concert music. They're all wearing tuxedos, right? Where's the clarinetist? He's strolling in. So this is an appeal to the idea of the strolling klezmer. And how is he dressed? He's wearing his concert thing, but he's got this Tevya hat. Okay. Okay, we'll just listen to a few seconds of the music. There's a lot of augmented seconds. Okay. And then it gets virtuoso, because it's concert music. Here he's going to get more. So uh, he's using the resources of Klezmer uh, in a context you know, for a different kind of agenda, which is an upward mobility agenda. We can write music that you will listen to in the concert hall, too. We're not just writing shows and, and Yiddish songs, okay? Um, so really, really fast. I've got about, yeah, five minutes. I can do this. Um, um, okay, so yeah, really quickly, the most famous possible example of crossover. Uh, I didn't mention crossover and fusion. This is another strategy. Um, if we can do something that other people will listen to too, we have got a better market going. And I mentioned this for Ready for Irving Berlin. The most famous all-time classic crossover item, you all know, it's called by Mirbet Sussain. I don't even have to play it for you. But um, the interesting thing is that the Andrews sister recorded. The, these are these three girls from Minnesota. And then it's recorded by the Berry sisters, formerly Bagelman sisters, um, who then are bringing back into the community, in Yiddish, a song that they know from me in English, from these goyim. Okay. So this is the way it works. The circulation patterns of Jewish American music are very intense and complex. Um, well, uh, yeah, I'll just put it on for a couple seconds. Um, I'll just look how they look. Will you say, here klaagt ze her, als die zoos weer liebe erklären. Wenn die redst mit die Oin, wo dich mit dir gefloin, wie die willst, sart mich nicht in. Wenn die hast, da willst alles sechel, in wenn die weiß dein Arisch und Schmechel. Wenn die tanz wie ein Indianer bist, da viel Galizianer, so gilt es hart mich nicht. Bei mir bist die Schein, bei mir hast die Schein. Oh, sorry. So the, the musical resources are straight American swing, straight mainstream music. Um, but the song talks about a Galiziano, which is then only in-house. In so you can do two things simultaneously. The, the great thing I'll say, which is really the most important thing about music, is there are 20 things happening at once in any musical item, or maybe 50. There is their clothing, their hairdos and all that. There is the stage they're on, where are they singing it? But then there is the question of the language. What is their pronunciation of Yiddish? It's a kind of a curious pronunciation of Yiddish. And uh, what are the instruments? And what are the, how are the instruments, et cetera, et cetera. You go down this checklist, it'll take you all day just to ra run down this one number. And this is what we ethnomusicologists or popular music studies people do. One last thing, because we have Dan Kahn in the house, then I'll turn it over. Um, however. I just heard from Dan that the piece that I thought was on the concert that he's doing is not on the concert. But it's a great piece to use. This is a different agenda. We need one leftist song. We need one working thing. Um, this is a song called Arbeit der Freuen, um, Working Women, from 1891. So as soon as they're coming here, they're doing socially relevant songs, okay? And writing them. These are the anarchists, okay? And, um, um, but to hear it in Dan Kahn's performance, which I'm going to play you, Look at the iconography, the images. What images are behind this? And how has he done the text in both Yiddish and English so it would be comprehensible to a wide audience? And what is the musical setting? So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll close out with that one. Why this is in Persian, I don't know. 
because it's international, okay? So the backgrounds are international. This is eclectic and cosmopolitan in Spanish, in Persian, okay? Because that's the workers' movement. It's workers of the world, right? There's guitars. So this is that kind of music, okay? Which is deeply Jewish American. Hardworking women, and then it goes to English with women, Persian translation. Who labor in factories and homes, join in the fight for its only beginning, and no one should stand in the struggle alone. Okay, um, okay. So I hope um, this is a kind of updating. Uh, it's a kind of nostalgia and heritage. At the same time, it's a nostalgia. For Jewish Yiddish materials, it's also nostalgia for the cultural front, you know, of the and for the old anarchist days, the 1890s. Um, so, at, again, listen hard to Jewish music and watch it, Jewish American music. How many things are going on at once? As you go to Carnegie Hall, try to think about that. Okay, I hope it gives you some sense of the complexity as well as the continuity of the vibrant, shifting, but very steady um, set of sensibilities that we call a, a Jewish American music. Um, so I'm going to now introduce um, our colleague from the forward, Hanak Pollock, who's going to uh, show us some uh, deep historical materials to go with this. Thanks. Hi, a good event. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Slobin. And thank you, Yivo, for inviting us to participate. Um, if you don't know us, we're the Forward. I'm the Forward Archivist. Uh, we were born in 1897 in April, so it's especially exciting to be here uh, because it's going to be our 122nd birthday in a couple of weeks. So, you know, we say bis 120, and we make 120 plus. So, thank you very much. Um, um, I was. Um, thrilled actually to be asked to take a dive into the forward and try to come up with how did the forward actually talk to immigrants, Jewish immigrants about music? What were the various ways that we talked about it and what do we have in our, in our archive that sort of speaks to it too? So um, the first thing I have here actually it was given to me by um, how many people here know the name Henry Sapoznik? Yes. So uh, we were gifted by Henry with this little ditty that um, was our radio theme. And again. Okay, fun. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, interestingly enough, he told me that he found it inside an album whose cover featured Israeli folk dances. So you never know. And uh, like many of you, I also assumed uh, when thinking about uh, music and immigrants and the forward newspaper of immigrants that mostly probably I'd find some traditional Yiddish folk music or something from our radio programs. You've probably all heard of WEVD, the station, right, that speaks your language, right? <laughs> Fantastic. So um, I was completely surprised when I learned, for example, in um, our earliest iteration, way back in 1897, when we still cost a penny and we ran about two pages, some of the first items I found about music were um, items that informed readers. Number one, that you don't go out on strike without a marching band to lead you. <laughs> yeah. And number two, that music could make you crazy, like this story. On the third night of Hanukkah back in 1897, Fred Roheimer, who was a musician with the um, Germania Theater, uh, theater Orchestra in New York, uh, actually uh, jumped out of his window on East 81st Street and was taken to the Presbyterian Hospital unconscious in critical condition. And according to witnesses, um, they say he lost his mind and was heard early that morning yelling that he couldn't stop hearing orchestral music played by broken down violins and um, mind-bending, bellowing drums that had rendered him completely restless and irritable. So, the forwards reported, he could be heard howling and just yelling at the orchestra to cease playing or that he would die, at which point he jumped. 
Yeah. Uh, on a lighter note, and more in keeping with the Forward's educational mission to its immigrant readers, was this item, also on the front page a year later in 1890 1899. It caught my attention because the, the headline itself says, a musical band will play. And it turns out a musical band will play tomorrow evening at 177 East Broadway where you can purchase tickets. And so I thought, oh, okay, I'll just read down the list and see you know, what else. And it turns out that they, they sort of grabbed the audience's attention. It was like clickbait, we would say today, by talking about the band. And below it was um, uh, inviting people uh, to come to union meetings. For example, the, yeah, right underneath, the Children's Jacket Makers Group was meeting and the Socialist Democratic Party you know, members come to the meetings. So you could think it was an invitation to listen to a band, but it was actually drawing the readership into political organizing. Or maybe it was actually the entertainment section of the paper, could very well be too, hard to know. Um, and here's the Young Forward celebrating its first anniversary, April 1898, and the leaders of the Forward and the readership were invited to an incredible literary evening with a huge concert in two theaters. And at both theaters, they were gonna feature the same program. Uh, the concert listed a Herr Meyerson performing a couplet, newly composed and named in honor of the forwards, and then a Herr Manescu would also perform several pieces, especially composed, but Probably most importantly, beloved Yiddish theater performer Bertha Kalish would offer, quote, her sweet voice so listeners could hear songs of paradise. And as you probably know, no immigrant concert was complete without violins, so a Miss Hochstein and a Master Zussman would also perform violin solos, and tickets sold for 15 to 50 cents. But seeing as we're a newspaper and our fate is intertwined with the news, on the day of these celebrations, this was the newspaper edition. It was an extra, and the forwards let its immigrant readers know that, in fact, the President McKinley had just asked for 125,000 volunteers in a call-up for the Spanish-American War. So here, a bit before the war and the anniversary, the forwards reports on the 1,000 shirt ironers, men and women, Jews and Gentile, marching together in a show of power. It was a march of striking shirt ironers de that they declared a rare, swift victory. It started at 131 Allen Street, went on for six blocks, and it was led by the band of the, quote, American Protective Musical Union and various strikers who joined them. So forward readers and their leaders marched and celebrated to classical and art song, it would seem. But of course, by the 20s, there were the cantors who seemed to dominate the pages. One of the first ads we ran uh, was a noted cantor, fan favorite, Chazen Sirota. Everybody know? Yeah. Uh, from the Tlomachsky uh, Shul in, in Warsaw, now in New York City, performing at the Metropolitan Opera House, and even more surprising to me, I don't know about you, with his daughter, Helena Sirota. Yeah. And um, according to this ad in our paper, she was a famous lyrical soprano. She had delighted European audiences. And the, the two together, father and daughter, would be performing Yiddish songs as yet unheard in America. Tickets cost between $1 and $3. And if you look at the, the way at the bottom, uh, funnily enough, they, they were so organized, they actually had American management, uh, and they were called the Jonas Brothers. So, I don't know, of 7th Avenue. The Jonas Brothers of 7th Avenue. Uh, so um, if you're, 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 you're reading the forwards in the 20s and you're loving cantorial music, along with other musical offerings the forwards encouraging, you probably want to buy a Victrola. And who can you trust to sell you that Victrola you can barely afford um, other than that other cantorial fan favorite, Yossela Rosenblatt, seen here? In an April ad for your Pesach listening pleasure, a Victrola um, by Rosenblatt, who was famously courted by operas the world over, and uh, Henry Rosenblatt, I don't know if you guys know this, but the son of Josela Rosenblatt is also a source for some of the more fun opera images that we actually have in the Forwards archive. And by fun, we mean Josela Rosenblatt's opera singer son, Henry Rosenblatt. He was known as a uh, basso buffo, I think a character, a, a comic opera performer. This is him in Barber of Seville. This is him in Tosca. And this is him. 
<laughs> and um, he lived on the Upper West Side. There's, if you go on YouTube and just um, you know search for Henry Rosenblatt, this is a beautiful documentary somebody made. He's walking, I think he lived in the Ansonia, I'm not sure. He's walking through one of those old Upper West Side apartments and he talks about the fact that he, his, his opera singers came to his father to be taught. So yes, Yossel Rosenblatt was courted by opera, but opera stars came to him to study. Henry had a similar practice on the Upper West Side and um, Henry talks about the death of his father, the, right? He, he died very early and um, that he passed on. Before, before he died, he actually, according to Henry, asked Henry to complete his work. So Henry split his time between performing in, in the opera, the Metropolitan Opera, um, teaching opera, and um, reworking or completing um, Josel Rosenblatt's uh, work. So if you find yourself in the 30s, you know, and you're reading the forwards and you're contemplating all this cantorial music wafting through the city, feel free to apply to this cantorial correspondence school. I'm not even sure how that could work. <laughs> I mean, like, what do you, I guess you notate what you're saying, I don't know. Uh, led by a Chazen Yaakov Mason of Grand Avenue, or perhaps you're gonna go out to Flatbush where you can hear the Zwieling Chazanim, the twin cantors who are reciting Slichus in the fall. And cantors seem to love our fearless, independent Jewish newspaper, or the readership, or maybe the ad rates were really good back then. Either way, we have a tremendous collection of cantors, mostly headshots, but occasionally in full regalia. And um, there's a little known subcategory of the Chazonim collection that uh, probably should be called boy cantors. This is Shalom Secunda, who of course went on to, to compose what we just heard by, by Mir Bistushain among other great pieces, and he became our music columnist when we sort of had one in the 70s in the Yiddish paper, and he covered the goings on with the Musicians Union, with Local 802 and the New York Philharmonic, among other things. Uh, here's another boy cantor some of you may remember, Kalma Levites. Yeah, this is him and his, like, you know, back in the day when you arrived and you were a celebrity, this is him, like, actually docking in New York City from Europe. Um, and so, you know, your, your photo would be taken and, of course, published in the forwards, like Fudin. And um, he, he had already, at this point, he was 12 years old when he arrived in New York City, reportedly had already been singing for half of his life. And um, when we published, a, a couple of years ago, we published this, you know, we do publish our archival uh, imagery in our, our magazine, we did in our paper, we do online. At the time that we, we published this, uh, an editor just was so taken with this image, she retitled it Cutie Cantor. <laughs> so feel free to use that search term if you're researching, Cutie Cantor. And you can also search for our women cantors because as a progressive Jewish paper, we of course included the latest in cantorial music. And in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, it was Lady Cousins. And they were fearless, as you can only imagine, in choosing this particular path, right, for their vocal talents. This is, uh, this Chazenta is Shandala the Chazenta. You may have heard her on WVD. She was actually born Jean Gornish of Philadelphia, but she sometimes billed herself as Shandala from Odessa, which is purportedly just a publicity stunt, like she was from Philadelphia. She, she actually wasn't, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and she's seen here on our radio uh, station, WEVD, in a show that was um, actually sponsored by Planters, and reportedly she and the other Chazentas who appeared with her on the show were obliged to honor their sponsor by singing the Planters theme. But, on the good side, she also supposedly had freedom to choose her own uh, material. So, uh, Shandala and Perala reportedly both performed in the 60s alongside the great Chazen um, David Kusevitsky. Um, this is, uh, some Chazanim actually sent in their publicity uh, photos to, to the forwards from Europe, and you can see the, the dry stamp on the side there. Um, this one is from a, a photo studio in Vienna. <coughs> And uh, if you're going to listen to some cantorial music, right, back in the 20s and the 30s, and some classical even, you may find yourself becoming interested in having your kids study piano, right? Uh, the Forvers provided you with some interesting feedback on that particular talent. This is an article from 1902 where we learned that playing piano is now the rage as part of your nadunya, as part of your dowry package. And the subject in this story was actually a music teacher teaching piano downtown to shop girls. So you might find you need to actually purchase a piano. And the forwards gave you many choices, though you may not have thought of this particular shop. I'm like, really? Very interesting. Like, was that a typo? I mean, I don't know. 
Uh, West 14th and 6th Avenue, he's got two stores. And the tagline uh, in English is, our miniature grand fills up the room with music, but not with its size. Because like, you're probably living in a tenement apartment, right? So like, <laughs> how are you going to do that? And um, you can listen to piano LPs on a Victrola for only $112.50 or layaway. I don't know if that was totally new, but $5 a month. And you can actually Pesach sale, huge sale, piano and player pianos and phonographs. And you can get it all at one shop, the Weiser Brothers on 2nd Avenue and also in Brooklyn. Pianos, player pianos, phonographs. And here at this shop, 3rd Avenue, and look, also up in the Bronx because Jews are moving. Yep. In the foreverts, there was also opera. And here is an image of, on the right side, uh, the beloved uh, Rosa Poncel. And she apparently also loved the forwards back. So on the back of that image, on the verso, there's a handwritten caption where the photographer, it was a forward photography, a photographer, supposedly this is at the Hollywood Bowl. He saw her there and he introduced himself and said, I am photographing for the forwards art section. And she said, take my picture and it's specifically for the forward. So that's our, our little caption on, on the back. Um, this is Irene Jacoby. Um, there were Jewish composers of note in the forward, like Irene Jacoby. She was a pianist. She was featured in 1943. WNYC hosted a Jewish music festival. And this image and their featured music, her, her husband, and I think Sally Pesco was the soprano. Um, you can actually find that image and the music from the 1943 Jewish music festival um, on our pages and also on WC's um, archive blog. We did that together with them. And um, sometimes, being an archivist, uh, you have to be a matseva whisperer, a tombstone whisperer. And this amazing image just really caught my attention. It's another beloved opera star. Her name was Rosa Raisa. She, uh, we came to learn about her because of this photo. It's a memorial obelisk in onyx. Uh, for her mother, who died of pneumonia in Bialystok when Rosa was only six. And Rosa had this incredible story of immigration. Shortly after her mother's death in 1906, there's a pogrom in Bialystok, the memory of which stayed with the opera star for the rest of her days, even causing her at some point to wonder if she could still sing, having witnessed such depravity. She flees the pogrom. Some relatives are going to the Isle of Capri. So she ends up there. Legend says she worked for them as a nanny housekeeper. And she's, you know, singing while she works. And the, it's Capri, so like, it's sunny, it's beautiful, the windows are open. And uh, supposedly, a local priest passed by one day and said, oh, dear God, you have to come to church and sing Ave Maria for me. And so I guess she did because her career took off and she ended up studying with Caruso's teacher, getting accepted to the Naples Conservatory. She debuts in a Verdi opera and the next thing you know she's in the United States and has a tremendously successful career at the peak of which she dedicates this memorial to her mother and her roots and we publish it. Um, not one to be mesmerized by opera stars and chazonim with miraculous talents, our satirist Beryl Botwinick, also known by his pseudonym Lead Pencil. In uh, 1920, he wrote here about the crop, or perhaps he meant glut, of cantors offering almost too many choices for the high holidays. Um, this is, I guess that's luxury problems. Uh, this is Florence Stern, one of several young Jewish violinists that we regularly featured. And then we're just going to take like a huge leap. Um, by the 50s, of course, a new group of immigrant survivors of the war are slowly arriving and the Catskills became a place to hear both Yiddish and cantorial music. And one of those immigrants, along with his partner in life and art, they become the couple who pen one of the longest running, most popular features of it in our paper, I bet you already know who I'm talking about, the Mlotex, right? Also known as like the human Yiddish jukeboxes. And uh, in case you don't know, uh, this, this page actually started out as um, Perl von Yiddish Lieder. It was about poetry, and it eventually morphed into like a name that tune. Readers would write in from all over with just a snippet 
of a song and the Mlotics were on it and they were able to like finish the, the entire song. And I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, it was one of our, our longest um, running um, features in the forward, probably a competitor to the Bintel Brief. So along with selling subscriptions to raise money and have additional income, the forward sold everything from silverware sets to reading lamps, sewing patterns, Yiddish books, and records. In 1970, as the Klezmer revival was yet to hit its peak, we sold albums such as this one that really caught my eye, the Ferschkos. Survivor musicians Sarah and husband Chaim were both classically trained, he on piano, and she is violinist with the Warsaw Philharmonic. Sent to entertain the Soviet partisans during the war, they were caught by the Germans and sentenced to a torture specifically for their talents. Both their left arms were amputated at the shoulder without anesthesia. They survived that and more, eventually immigrating to the United States where they continued to perform. And the forwards presented their albums for sale. And it's probably not a surprise to anyone here that, you know, one of the songs they perform, of course, is the Zognit Kemal, the Partisan's Hymn, right? But more surprising to me is this song that I'm going to play that um, they performed. And it's been performed before, I'm sure you know it, I believe, right? It, Mahalia Jackson, the great singer, uh, performed it. And here they are performing Sarah, I'm going to play it for you in a minute, Sarah Fershko. Um, singing as she could no longer play the violin and Chaim accompanying her on piano with his remaining arm. <laughs> going to have our panel now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, as you can see, so many things uh, resonate there uh, with, with what the kinds of things I was trying to lay out for you. Uh, and the media are extremely important um, of all sorts in propagating and, and putting out Jewish music. Um, so I think I, we have... Um, some very distinguished uh, people uh, who are going to, oh, this is still running. Right. Uh, some very distinguished people um, who are going to um, fill in, in a sense, um, uh, some of the kinds of things we've been talking about from their live experience. They are going to be at the concert at Carnegie Hall. Um, and I think uh, you, will, you will recognize them. Lawrence Glamberg, uh, Daniel Kahn, Eleanor Risa. Uh, so um, I, this is not a, an official panel. This is kind of a, a dialogue. Or, um, and uh, I'm just going to throw out a couple of leading questions and see where it takes us. Uh, these are people who have been actively engaged in um, bringing the uh, Jewish American, uh, not just bringing them to Jewish American music audience, but creating it and, and giving us a sense of what we, uh, what we think of as uh, Jewish American music. Um, and of course, Lauren is sitting on the treasure uh, chest right here with the Evo archive of recorded uh, music, which is uh, extraordinary. You should all go online and look at things like the Ruth Rubin collection uh, which is now totally digitized and available for you. You can listen to like over a thousand songs um, sung from folks moil, really uh, from the, the, the actual you know, singers that were collected from. Uh, part of the project of, um, okay. part of, the project of, of Jewish music is its restoration and preservation. Uh, and this building, uh, this building is extraordinary that way and the Forverts archive. We have to really uh, do a shout out to people that 
um, keep the historical record for us. Um, and then we have people who create the new sounds and uh, have been doing it for audiences uh, for, for many, many years. Um, I thought maybe we could start, I mean, having laid out this history, um, I, was gonna, I thought I'd ask you all if you, how do you see yourselves fitting into the kind of unfolding that I've you know, been suggesting, or, or do you not? Do you think what you're doing is really new and different? Um, I mean, you know, how do you recognize the, this long arc uh, within your own, with your own trajectories, um, if that's something you could speak to? Um, I, I would say that we, I, I feel like I stand on the shoulders of what came before. Um, I'm not a scholar, but uh, I'm more of an instinctual artist, but I like Yiddish is my first language, and so when I sing in Yiddish, to me it's not, uh, I'm not recreating anything. I'm speaking in my own voice with my own point of view and my own opinion and my own story that I wish to tell about the world or myself or, but I, stand on everything that came before me and and I continue to learn about the past and that's how my work grows. There is that continuity as many, I mean, this culture, this society of Jewish American society is so fractured by history. I mean, the end of immigration, the liquidation of the so-called old country, um, the creation of the state of Israel, I mean, that there is any kind of continuity at all with the a degree of assimilation that the American Jews have, have accomplished uh, miraculously kind of in this country. Um, it's, a lot of it is due to people who have it, who grew up with it, and who continue doing it. And um, so when we talk about revival, it's a really not a very good term. Um, it's a revival for, you know, revival is usually about people who come to something late, um, and who are picking up something new in a way and reappreciating, reevaluating. But um, it's, it's different to talk about revitalization, um, which is the term I think a lot of us prefer, because it's putting new energy in, you know, into something that's there, it's still alive, it's still vital. You're just giving it a new extra, a shot of energy. Um, ben, do you want to say something? Um, well, I, I, did, I did experience a kind of revival within myself. Because for, for me, I, I also come from, from Detroit, um, and I did not grow up with Yiddish kite or Yiddish language, uh, except in, in the most remote, assimilated, sort of background way. I really came to it later in life, when I was already involved in music and in theater and in songwriting. And I got into Klezmer music, and I, I went to Klez Canada, and I met folks like Lauren and Michael Alpert and Adrian Cooper. And I made connections with folks in my generation. And I just was so deeply inspired by the intergenerational dialectic. Yeah, that's very important. The, yeah. co the, con the conversation uh -huh. and the debate of th that is carried through people's work and personal creativity. Like, like Eleanor said, that it's, it's, it's about expressing oneself. It, I don't know if, if, if it's so much or only about a kind of abstract continuity right. of carrying this Yerusha forward. And, you know, I, I think that when you look at the history it's, it's a history of, of betrayals of one tradition in the name of another, and it okay. was always dialectic. It was always people, you know, that, that's what that Moisha Oyster movie is about, you know? And, right. And, and so I, I think, um, I, I, I was never into some sort of flat, direct uh -huh. traditionalism. Um, I was just turned on by how funky and heterogeneous everything is and yeah there's a kind of musical magnetism is, is the term i've used about that that just people are drawn in like this is amazing stuff um i 
and then they recognize it in themselves. It's like, you know, they feel this echo of the thing and they say, what's going on here? This is resonating for me. Uh, and um, so I have to do something about that fact. A lot of really interesting issues there, but the learn, do you want to talk about the? Uh, whatever. Uh, well, uh, I'm somewhere in, in the middle. It, it, I, I kind of discovered my own kind of artistic uh, voice, uh, sort of literally um, through, through this music, and it wasn't exactly something I grew up with, but I grew up, I'm part of a family that, that were from Ukraine, that were uh, Yiddish speakers, um, that had this uh, culture, and, um, and I sort of came in this circle and uh, found not only my, you know, my voice in a place where I uh, belonged, but also the idea that I could help pass this music on to other people. Mm -hmm. And and now, you know, having worked uh, at Yivo now uh, since uh, 2000 as the sound archivist, uh, had the opportunity uh, to be able to help people, you know, find this material uh, through uh, the sound archive and also uh, to be able to work with uh, treasures like the Ruth Rubin collection and being able to go through it piece by piece and uh, you know being able to amass you know the knowledge of what's in there and be able to have give people access to that and I think I get the most pleasure from from being able to do to do that uh, which is kind of funny because it's I never would have thought that that that's where I would end up but here I am. Well, I'm so glad that you mentioned Hannah Malatek, uh, who was, um, uh, it was a great privilege of mine to work with her on, on projects, and uh, th th this was extraordinary. The, no the depth of knowledge and the generosity and the, and the, um, the sheer in insight that, that Hannah had for this music uh, into her 90s was, it, she really was legendary uh, in that respect, and that's something else that Yivo did. Do you want to say something about this? I, oh, I, yeah. I wanted to just uh, flash back a second. Um, you know, as I was working on this, it occurred to me that um, just, just how grateful I was to people who dedicated their lives to Yiddish music because I studied it, you know, formally in school, but I can tell you, you know, there's the classroom and then there's the music you're listening to outside the classroom. And to this day, you know, it's the music I, I live to, it's, you know, I love to it. I mean, it's just like so profound what you guys have done. And um, it just informs my love of Yiddish. So, you know, when I see exciting projects, you know, like Alex's project that just came out or, you know, all the exciting stuff, like, yeah, I'm just like in awe of you guys. I can barely believe I'm up here. <laughs> <laughs> We're glad but, to have you, right. Um, well, let's, let's talk about what's happening right now then, um, because I've been very struck in the last few years. Um, at, like, I was at Class Canada teaching and then at Yiddish New York. Um, at the young, very young people, uh, 20s, people in their 20s and early 30s, who are coming to this <coughs> traditions of Jewish American music, this particular tradition, whereas 10 years, 15 years before that, they were not doing that at all. Right now, they are really eager to do Yiddish language, to write songs of their own in Yiddish, and all of you are engaged in educating them and teaching them uh, in these workshops. Um, so um, I wonder if you have some thoughts about what is it that's going on right now in the light of this big historical trajectory? Um, because I was caught by surprise to see this happening now. Well, for one thing, I think that um, now uh, people can actually grow up hearing this music living um, and being, you know, rejuvenated and recreated and and that, you know, the people have been able, you know, to hear, you know, to hear Yiddish growing up and people have been able to hear uh, uh, musicians uh, playing uh, klezmer and people have been able to hear people singing Yiddish songs, um, you know, from the time they're, they're kids and people people's parents are teaching them Yiddish and speaking Yiddish at home and that's something that wasn't going on when I when I was growing up. Uh, so that's kind of remarkable. It really uh, is. So what's it like working with these youngsters? You're asking me? Well. <laughs> <laughs> I used to be a youngster. All right. Um, but I just wanted to say that there was a time, I mean, I worked with a lot of 
older artists, and there was a time when it, we were ashamed. There was a time when you, you know, you spoke Yiddish quietly, when when you, you didn't really want to know what was being said, you didn't want to learn what was being said. I think the opposite, actually. You just wanted to learn the, the, the blonde American way. And so those people were alive at one time and they just were not given COVID yes, and they just yes. were not turned to as teachers, as as uh, beacons to inspire and emulate. So it's to me a very uh, terrible sadness. Yes, there's a great loss of, uh, in this um, period of, the grand period of indifference, and there was, and, and it's a sliding scale from indifference to total hostility. It's such a great term, the period of indifference and, <laughs> and, and the period of shame. Yeah, and, it's, and ignorance. And, I mean, and ignorance. There's a lot of ignorance about it. There was a lot of ignorance. Um, you just, well, I mean, you all know the story when they did Fiddler on the Roof and put it on Broadway and Zero Mustel got bored doing this show every night, he would throw in a Yiddish word and he would be, just get worked over by, you know, by Jerome Robbins. Don't bring down the level of the show. Okay, and now we have the thing in Yiddish on Broadway, okay? So talk about a shift over, um, well, you know, it's, it's almost 60 years, right? Uh, this shift. It's over 50 years. So, um, but that's an, a very significant shift from Yiddish as the language of comedy only uh, or as the language of parents keeping secrets or something you didn't really want to deal with um, to it being, we've got the show in Yiddish on Broadway now. We didn't just conquer the world, you know, in English, right? Uh, you were going to say something, Dan, I thought. Well, I think, well, you asked about younger folks and, you know, I... Um, there's a lot of really inspired, there's a groundswell of, uh, and a sea change in the way I think a lot of younger, um, not only American, I live in Europe, and so I think this is true for, for the younger, for a, a whole generation of younger um, Jewish folks. There's a sea change in the way they think about Jewish identity. Um, and that has to do with um, a reinvestment, a very personal reinvestment, in ideas about diasporism, uh, about their heritage, about European Jewish history, Jewishness as um, a migratory transnational culture as opposed to a national or nationalist mm -hmm. culture, and also the very deep history of Jewish secularism. And there's a political and social component to that too, which, which I think is an important thing yes. for, for me and, and yeah. for a lot of young folks yeah. who, are all, who are now learning Yiddish and, and you know, and you see that in, in you know, uh, rallies, you know, in, in the Women's March, I think was the first mm -hmm. place yeah. where you saw Mevelen Zaiba Leben, which yeah. is, uh, has now become a real like, you know, parole for, for um, young, Jewish resistance to contemporary fascism and and racism and nationalism and and I think that um, that's an important connection and there's a lot of important work that's been done uh, over the last decades by folks who were a lot more marginal then yeah in mm -hmm. in Jewish cultural discourse. Um, around issues of gender and sexuality and political questions right. and expressing those things through Yiddishkeit. I mean, and, and, and you know, if you build it, they, uh, they will come. You know, it's like if you do the work long enough, uh, it's, you're not doing it in the dark and then things, it has, it has an effect and, you know, like I can, you know, it's... Well, my, my job is always to say, but it was always like that, you know, because I'm, I'm always trying to point out these continuities as you've gathered. Um, so, I mean, one of my favorite songs um, is talking about, you know, equality. I mean, of course, it's not post-gender. It's not, that was not in there yet. But if you look 100, over 100 years ago, there's a wonderful song called Weiber macht mich war Präsident. Uh, women elect me president, which I was hoping would be Hillary Clinton's theme song, but she didn't, <laughs> she didn't get there so we could give it to her. 
But that is a wonderful one like Vatsir Step, which says, um, uh, let the men know what it's like to, um, they should wash diapers. They should go look for bargains at Wanamaker's store and let the corset fetch them at least uh, once a year. Uh, and so women elect me president will change America. So, you know, here are all these women running for president now this year, right, on this progressive model. And um, it was in the Yiddish tradition in like 1912, okay? So rediscovery is, is really important. Um, and um, I like your word rejuvenation is a nice one too. It's like, yeah, that means to make things young again to rejuvenate, make it young, as if it's young and fresh again, even though the thing is sort of a, a hundred years old in many ways. That's the uh, paradox of, you know, of looking at history. As you can see the continuities, but people don't know them. So they're recreating something without realizing it's that, there's, it's, that it's cyclical. There's a cycle at work here. Um, you mentioned Europe, and, um, but for those people, of course, well, we're not talking about Europeans, this is Jewish Americans here. Um, but the, uh, one of the um, things that everybody forgets about the 1920s and 30s is that everybody was going back to Europe, back and forth to Europe. They picked up wives and brought them here. They went home to visit their old um, grandparents. Uh, they went to weddings. And, and there was a constant communication and a kind of un understood assumption that, that, as you say, it was a transnational system uh, of multiple diasporas. And so what is so particularly odd and in a way deeply ironic is that it comes to places like Germany um, that didn't know this uh, and weren't engaged in that kind of process as much as Eastern European Jews. And, um, but they feel they can be part of that world, which is essentially partly because it's a European world. You know? So for Europeans, it's not like learning Arabic music you know, or, or Chinese music or playing an Indonesian gamelan. It's rather close. And they can imagine and project from what they, how they've been brought up, and even by ear, of how this might be related to them in some way. So the Jewish American experience is, oddly enough, a European experience, um, which can then be exported to Europe and domesticated by Europeans as, in a sense, an American form. So the complexity of all this is really just mind-boggling, and it, it gives us great stuff to study and, and to think about as we go along. Uh, Warren, do you have anything to? Chip in about that. Um, I guess, um, and we'll be running out of time shortly, but um, speaking about resources, and not necessarily your strategies and agendas, though I'm glad to hear about them, but even the resources, how do you, how do you find new, new resources? How do you, and then how do you go about selecting and making their own so that you know, they're not just something you found out there? <clears throat> what, what is resource selection, s sourcing as we call it these days? What is sourcing like? So we're all totally different in that regard. And um, uh, I, 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 <laughs> you know, um, I, uh, I look, I, I don't read music well. I don't read Yiddish well. Um, I, I often turn to others as my resources. I um, hear things and they strike me. Uh, usually it's the words that, that, that interest me, the story that the words are telling. Um, and uh, I, I've worked on my Yiddish reading and worked on my uh -huh. music reading. And this gate, Pavola Pavola Zeya Langsam, of this gate, of the Yuren Geyen Ochit. <laughs> um, so, but, but there's progress, in case anybody was worried. There is progress. Um, so these guys are totally different, and maybe you should say, and then we could talk a little about what we did at Carnegie Hall, um, which I'm really happy to talk about if you want. Sure. Uh, well, early on, early on in my work with the Clismatics, I, I sort of realized that I only wanted to sing things that I actually could could believe in because, you know, historically there were plenty of people who were who were singing, you know, chestnuts or things that, you know, were nostalgic or sentimental, and they're you know, songs are popular because they're good, generally speaking. So, the things that people were singing were you know were you know beautiful songs, but 
songs not, that not, didn't necessarily have anything to say to me or that I wanted to, you know, convey what, you know, their message or, you know. So I uh, started looking, you know, into, you know, songs from the, uh, the, the Jewish, the labor movement, um, uh, songs that maybe you could fool around with, with you know, the gender specifics of the song. Um, uh, some cases borrowing songs from other traditions that I thought would would uh, sound good in Yiddish or that cry out to for people to know them for them to be better known so uh, songs like uh, the song Der Joch which uh, is a, a, a Catalonian a protest song from the 60s a La Staca uh, and you know, or songs right from right here at home, say uh, songs by by uh, that are written by Holly Near, like like I ain't afraid or or um, uh, I am willing. Um, these songs that that have a similar worldview as the the songs from the Yiddish labor uh, uh, tradition. And I thought, you know, why don't people know these songs? And people in my world, in our world, should know these songs. And if you if you sort of migrate them into Yiddish and make them culturally specific too, then it's like you're, you know, everybody wins because uh, people are knowing this other body of work that they may not be familiar with. And I get to sing great songs that otherwise I would sort of have a difficult time uh, finding a reason, you know, for singing them in my normal, uh, you know, work. So. That's sort of been one of the great things about about you know being in the Yiddish uh, song scene and being able to do that. So I'm very I'm very happy with 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 that and what I've done. Yeah. I have exactly the same answer as Lauren. <laughs> okay. Good. 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 So tell us about the Carnegie Hall. So Car so Carnegie Hall is such a has been such an interesting journey. Uh, because they, uh, we, uh, Seth Rugavoy and I have been engaged by them for like two years, and and try to encapsulate uh, a century of uh, Jewish song, really? it, right? I mean, it, so it was like we had lists and lists of tunes. We had lists and lists of Abba Freuden and. Uh, and who are the artists, and who are the uh, composers, and who is left out. Mm -hmm. And it was just a constant struggle and a constant, if you put in this one, what goes in here, and how do we tell this story with, uh, the, so in a way there's so much left out. Of course. Uh, and, 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 right. and that was the challenge of, of figuring out um, what was in, who was in, and uh, and and si siphoning out what we could do to tell a, a moving, theatrical, funny, touching tale. Um, what 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 can we say about it more? The artists are are young and old. The artists are. Uh, Multi gender, multi racial. Say a little thing about, say something about Evgeny Kissin, maybe everybody doesn't know. Well, I mean, Evgeny Kissin is one of the artists, and so is Gil Shaham, and, and Evgeny is. These are world class concert artists, but they want to be on a, on a program. Not only they want to be, Kissin is a propagandist for yes, yes. Yiddish poetry. I mean, uh, he'll be playing. He'll be playing and doing two poems. One by one of his own. Extraordinary. And one by Boris Sandler. Um, and besides that, we have Tony winner Katrina Lenk, who is not Jewish, who is in fact doing a version of of Berlin's Russian lullaby. Oh, great! Yes, yeah, so, well, that's why it's um, on the program. Right? And and, you know, David Krakauer, it, it, Mike Burst, and these two uh, wonderful artists, um, Elmore James. I, I mean, I hope you can come. I, we'll it's listen. sold out, so don't, you know. I, I think you can still, it is sold out, but they say it's po everything is possible. Right. Well, it's nice how many of you are coming. Did you, you had something else you wanted to say, I think? I wanted, um, when Lauren, when you were talking about uh, Yiddish and English and um, working songs in both languages, I just wanted to 
bring into the room uh, Phyllis Burke, who we lost uh, last week. Uh, some of you may have seen her amazing uh, performance, Beatnik Bubby. And, um, you know, very early on in my Yiddish life, uh, my attention was really grabbed by the fact that she sings uh, Brother Can You Spare a Dime in Yiddish and English. It's, you know, I just want to speak, speak to that about Phyllis. And, and indeed, I, uh, I was, that's who I had, one of the people I had in mind when I mm -hmm. said people are not acknowledged and people yeah. who were the real thing uh, had a life that should have been elevated like this, but instead was she was not seen as the talent that she was, but she, and indeed she was. Well, it's great as now, you know, when, when Ruth Rubin was doing it that, in that Age of Indifference, it was, you know, she would, she sang Yiddish songs. Nobody, not many people wanted to hear it. And when she would appear to do a, she talks about how she would appear at some Hadassah chapter or somewhere, they would say, where's your accompanist? And she said, I don't have one. They'd say, oh. And they say, where's your guitar? And she said, I don't have one. I'm just going to sing songs. And they're like, this is not possible. You know, nobody did that. Even in the Yiddish world, you had to sing it with a pianist in a fancy arrangement at the top of your voice, you know, in this wonderful emotional uh, kind of declamatory style. Um, and that's how you did Yiddish songs. She said, no, these are unaccompanied folk songs that were simp simply sung by women at home and in their social circles. Um, so now we all know this, and this is what we're doing. Um, and um, uh, I am coordinating a project with a number of, of uh, stellar figures in the Yiddish song world to uh, put out a website, uh, which will be called Inside the Yiddish Folk Song, which will be the um, a user's guide uh, to, the, to, the, to the Yiddish folk song, the unaccompanied Yiddish folk song. There, you would not believe this, particularly if you, you know, if you go to Budapest to the Academy of Sciences, there will be a wall as long as this of studies of the Hungarian folk song not to speak of the tens of thousands of recordings, literally, that are sitting in fireproof cabinets and all that. There is not a single analytical article about the Yiddish folk song. Like, this is its structure, its metrics, its modality. Um, this is how it works. This is the aesthetic of singers in producing sounds. There is nothing to read about this tradition. I mean, it's not just the people, but the whole tradition has been completely um, obscured by history. So uh, that's what we're doing. Uh, it's going to be the ultimate. Um, so this is with uh, Josh Woletsky and Zev Feldman and uh, Michael Alpert and um, it's a Gottesman and Ethel Rehm. Uh, these are the, the people um, who, who, you know, most of the people, some of them are here too, but uh, who uh, were brought up with it though and, 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 and are steeped in it and, and teach it. Um, uh, and, and so forth. So that's going to be the, the uh, that's the kind of thing again, which can which is useful now, uh, because when I, I thought of doing a book like this yeah, years ago, I thought there just aren't enough songs anybody can listen to. There was like, where are you going to listen to the stuff? Why can you you can't just give a few songs in a book and say well, go find the rest of this somewhere, which you can't. And now, um, so you all know the archive, Ruth Rubin, the Ben Stonehill archive, and also something called Yiddish Song of the Week which is available to you online, free, uh, which is launched by It's a Gothisman, is constantly putting up new songs from oral tradition. Each one has the Yiddish in original and transliteration and the English, but it tells you how the singer learned it. It tells you what the context of that song is. If you want to learn those things, that's there. So this thing, I'm only doing one corner here because this is Evo and we're doing Yiddish stuff, but the kinds of things that are going on in liturgical music lately, the kinds of things that a Debbie Friedman did with Jewish American music, uh, or a Shlomo Karlbach, this is also Jewish American music, or that are going on, you know, right across the river in, in Brooklyn. Um, these are revolutionary things too, uh, as well, you know, so we shouldn't only think of this, of, of this being some kind of a, you know, small scale Yiddish, uh, Yiddish moment. All of Jewish music is live, dynamic, shifting and has a kind of continuity and stability that would be the last thing you could ever expect given uh, what this people and what this music has been through. So thanks for all for coming and it was great to be here.